All right, so tonight we are going to continue on the story of Naboth the Jezreelite. And now we're going to get into, remember we talked about how Ahab was judged and he died in battle. Now we're going to go over to 2 Kings 9 where we see Jezebel's judgment being carried out. Now this is many years later. You know, and this is something we have to think about when we do something that is worthy of chastisement, right? We ought to have this fear of God in us. Not only as unbelievers are going to fear God one day when they're thrown into hell, but as believers, we ought to fear God that we are not going to get away with willful sin. You know, like these things happen. God makes sure judgment is carried out on these wicked people, but he also makes sure chastisement is carried out on his children, just as a loving father would make sure discipline is carried out and that's one thing as well like uh for, for the kids um if you have uh if you guys sit well today i've got i've got different stickers today as well so if you guys want a sticker you can have one as well but if you remember in the story you know naboth was really nobody you know we didn't really know much about him except he had a parcel of land and yet god saw to it that his judgment uh, in terms of his blood was repaid and what's interesting about the judgment of Ahab's house and Jezebel is it happens many years later. If you remember, Ahab died in battle. It's many years later now that this judgment is happening. And I bet Jezebel and Ahab's house, they're still ruling and reigning. They probably think they got away with it. And this is how wicked people are today. If you remember when we read in, in Peter where it says, in the last days scoffers will come. And they're saying, hey, where is the promise of his coming? Right? You're saying Jesus is going to return and he's going to you know, uh, come with a vengeance, right? But it's been 2,000 years, you know? Yeah, well, God has mercy in that sense. He has some grace. He's long-suffering, right? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But eventually, judgment comes. And it's the same when God uses Jehu, which is one of the captains of the army of Ahab's house, right? Of, um, of the nation of Israel, actually uses Jehu to carry out this judgment. So let's start off in 2 Kings 9. We'll go through the story and then I'll just finish off with a few applications I think are interesting with this story. 2 Kings 9. So if you remember, we finished in 1 Kings 22. So we're jumping a few chapters now. So Elijah has now been taken up to heaven. He's, he's ordained you know, Elisha to take his place and Elisha is now sort of the main prophet that's going on through 2 Kings. Uh, verse 1, and Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets. So Elisha has people that he's discipling as well, right? So he has prophets that are under him, and he's uh, sort of the head honcho there um, in, in the room of Elijah, now that Elijah's gone. And said unto him, so Elijah's talking to one of the prophets that is under him, and says unto him, gird up thy loins. So that's just a, a way the Bible says kind of get ready, get prepared, right? Get, get, you know, it's like put on your, put on your outfit and get, get ready to go. Take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. So remember, this is what they, they were fighting over this land, if you remember when we talked about it last time. Ramoth Gilead, this is where Ahab died. And when thou comest thither, so when you get there, look out there, Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, now, they're quite specific which Jehu this is because there's another Jehu in the Bible, if you didn't know, there's a Jehu that is a prophet as well. So he's the son of, I think, Hanani, which we'll see later. This is Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. So he's generally known in short as Jehu, the son of Nimshi. Now, for those of you who know Jehu and you know his stories, there's one characteristic that Jehu is known for, right? And what is that? He's known for his zeal. Right, is known for his passion, and we'll see that. So this week we're going to go through 2 Kings 9 and start to see a bit of zeal from uh, uh, Jehu, the son of Nimshi, and then next week we're going to finish off in 2 Kings 10 and see some of the things that Jehu did and how he ended. And when thou comest, thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. So he's saying, hey, look for Jehu, get him to stand up, take him into an inner room. Then take the box of oil, pour it on his head and say, thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee, tarry not. So Elisha's saying to this other prophet, he's saying, hey, go find Jehu, take this box of oil. When you find him, 
get him to go into an inner chamber, inner chamber, inner room, anoint him with oil, say, thus saith the Lord, I have anointed the king of Israel, and then open the door and then just run. Just go. <laughs> right? That's what he's saying. Don't tarry. Tarry no. He's saying, don't wait around. Now, this prophecy of Jehu um, being uh, an, uh, anointed, or Jehu slaying Ahab's house, this actually started in 1 Kings 19. After, if you remember, if we went through the story of uh, 1 Kings 18 on Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. So that was 1 Kings 18, right? 1 Kings 19 is when Jezebel comes after, uh, uh, comes after Elijah. And Elijah has to flee into the mountain. And then he's like saying, oh, I'm the only one left. And he's asking to die. And then and, you know, God sort of speaks with him softly and things. Well, after God approaches him and, and speaks with him softly, he gives him instruction. And this is where the prophecy of Jehu actually carrying out this judgment is actually established. It says here, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. So this is after sort of he's, he's comforted uh, Elijah in the mountain when he's fleed from Jezebel. And when thou comest, look at this, anoint Hazael, to be king over Syria. Now, what I find interesting about this is, you know, you think God is God's and his prophets are sort of only dealing with, with Israel and Judah, right? Remember the split kingdom, anointing kings over Judah and Israel? But here, God actually gets Elijah to go and anoint a king over Syria, right? So what does that tell? That tells me that God has a hand in actually other nations as well as just Judah and Israel. So I mean, God was the one that raised up Nebuchadnezzar. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar came, and I can't remember the exact story, but I think it was one of the captains that spoke to Jeremiah saying, hey, it was actually the Lord that told us to come and do this. So isn't it interesting that it's not like God is just dealing only with Israel and Judah and not with other nations. He's putting other kings in power and other places as well and actually sending Elijah and saying, hey, you're going to go to Syria and anoint Hazael to be the next king over Syria. I, I just think that's interesting, right? So it's just like God has a, a play in, in everything. So it's not like, I guess, I guess the question is, it's like, it's like people, the reason why I think it's important is because people think, oh, you know, the nation of Israel, the Jews, it's just like, that's just their excuse that God is just telling them to go and take this land and God's telling them to do that, right? Because that's what like, the Muslims do. It's like, oh, God's telling them, we've got to go take this land, take that. Oh, oh, very convenient that God's getting you to do all these things and take all this land, right? But what we see here is that it's not only Jerusalem. You know, it's not only Samaria. He actually is dealing in Syria as well and saying, hey, the Syrians are going to do this to his own people. So you see how he's actually sort of uh, doing things all over the world as opposed to just, you know, fulfilling the desires of one nation. Does that make sense? So it's like he's, he's got plans that, that all work together. It's not just there's just one favored nation that he's just like, you know, and, and, and it be, can be said that, oh, you know, he's just doing it for the Jews. It's just Jews using God to get land as opposed to God actually uh, appointing things and ordaining things in place. So anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. So this is what he's telling Elijah. Elijah, um, I think uh, Elijah doesn't actually end up doing these things. I think Elisha actually ends up doing these things. And Jehu, look at this, here's, here's where Jehu is. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. Right? So this is where it's prophesied already. You say, hey, you're going to anoint Hazael over Syria. Jehu, you're going to anoint over is Israel. Right? So you remember the two kings. So he's not king over Judah. He's king over Israel. But this doesn't happen until later, right? Because that's what we're going to read about now in 2 Kings 9. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Ab Ab Abel, Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So he's saying, king of Syria, king of Israel, and Elisha is going to be your successor, right? When you go. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. Right? So you see how they're getting already attacked by Hazael because there is war when we read in 2 Kings 9, between Israel and Judah, they're kind of working together to fight against Syria. And who are they fighting against? They're fighting against Hazael, right? Which is this king that's been anointed. And him that escapeth from the sword shall, shall Jehu slay. So what God is saying here, he's, he's, he, when, he, when, when Syria fights Israel and Judah, who Hazael doesn't kill, Jehu's going to kill, right? Jehu shall, and whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, shall Elisha slay. So if Jehu doesn't wipe out everybody of the house of Ahab, right, and, 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 and have judgment on, 
on uh, you know this king because this is at the time if you remember first kings 18 was ahab with the prophets of baal now it's 19 so it's talking about this wicked king ahab and his house hey whoever escapes elisha will slay but you know jehu actually did carry out the whole task so elisha didn't have to slay any of uh, of ahab's house and here's the famous verse right that we all know yet have i left me seven thousand in israel all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which had not kissed him. Because this is quoted in Romans. So this is the context now of that passage, right? The seventh hour saying that there's always a faithful remnant. If you feel like you're being alone, if you are alone, there's always a faithful remnant. There's always people out there serving God. You're never the only one left. You may sometimes feel like you're the only one left. And that's why it's a good reminder to come to church to, 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 to be reminded that you're not the only one left um so it's very important that you're part of church otherwise sometimes in the world you just feel like you're the only one taking a stand right it's the same with uh elijah on the mount he thought he was the only one taking a stand and god reminded him no there's still seven thousand uh in israel all the knees which have not bowed unto baal so why unto baal because that's what ahab and jezebel made israel do they were worshiping baal and every mouth which had not kissed him so that's where it first starts right that Hazael will be king and jehu will be king in israel and slay them and whoever they don't slay elisha's going to slay all right let's go back to second kings 9 so the young man this is the prophet remember that elisha is told to go and anoint uh jehu even the young man the prophet went to ramoth gilead and when he came behold so behold means look behold the captains of the host were sitting and he said i have an errand to thee o captain right so he's saying hey i've got some, i've got a message for you captain but, but the, all the captains of the host are sitting there so there's multiple captains of the army of israel right jehu is one of them okay uh, i have an errand to thee o captain and jehu said unto which of all of us right because they're all sitting here and he said to thee o captain right to jehu and he arose and went into the house so see, he's following what he was commanded of elisha from the lord and he poured the oil on his head and said unto him thus saith the lord god of israel i have anointed thee king over the people of the lord even over israel and thou shalt smite the house of ahab so you remember there were multiple judgments that ahab would die in battle that his house would you know he'd be, have no posterity left in israel and then the second one we'll see later thy master that i may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets and the blood of all the servants of the lord at the hand of jezebel for the whole house of ahab shall perish and i will cut off from ahab him that pisseth against the wall now i don't know why the bible uses that sort of phrase to describe men um, people have their theories right because you know men are meant to stand up when they pee as opposed to sit down I, I don't know i think that's a bit of an interpolation in the sense that you can you can come to that conclusion it's not particularly saying that i think that it's necessarily a sin for a man to sit down when he pees right but what this is saying here that's a phrase that the bible uses to describe men him that pisseth against the wall and you'll see that multiple times in the bible and him that is shut up and left in israel and i will make the house of ahab like the house of jeroboam the son of nebat and like the house of baasha the son of ahijah we're going to see a bit of that story about baasha a bit later but these are kings prior to ahab right that also made israel do wickedly do you remember the sin of jeroboam the son of nebat what was it any of the guys know rebellion. rebellion but what did he do for specifically you remember he you know he was anointed as one of the kings but do you remember what his sin was yeah the idols right do you remember so he made the two calves the two golden calves right so if you remember he made two golden cars he made it so that's when they when it talks about the sin of jeroboam the son of nebat that's what they were doing so it says here when when they walk in the like the sins of jeroboam the son of nebat so he's saying baasha the son of ahijah he was also worshiping and causing israel to worship these two cars ahab did the same and he did even worse than that he also made them worship baal so uh, baasha and the dogs shall eat jezebel in the portion of jezreel and there shall be none to bury her and he opened the door and fled so he actually so this prophet that was sent by elisha did what he was told right found jehu took him into a room anointed him right told him hey you're gonna wipe out ahab's house and you're gonna fulfill the the judgment of jezebel and the portion of jezreel and then he just opens the door and he just runs off right 
Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and one said unto him, Is all well? So now Jehu is anointed, right? And that prophet has just told it, because it's in an inner room, so the other captains don't know what's going on. He gets the oil, oil poured on his head. He's just been anointed king, and the guy just dashes off, right? Without him. So he comes out of, of the chamber, and his captains that are there sitting with him, one said unto him, Is all well? Is everything okay? Wherefore came this mad fellow to, he, to thee? Now, when you see mad in the Bible, that, that's the, the English word to be crazy, right? Not, ma not mad like we use it, to be angry. So he says, wherefore, why came this mad, this crazy man to thee? And look at what Jesus says. And he said unto them, you know the man. He's, he's kind of like brushing it off, right? He's like, you know what he's like, right? And he's, you know the man in his communication. He's just kind of like, yeah, you know what those guys are like, right? It's crazy. And they said, it is false. They're like saying, no, nah, no, something, something's happened. Tell us now. And he said, thus and thus spake he to me. So he, he said these things to me, saying, thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. So it's funny that Jehu is kind of brushing it to saying, yeah, you know what he's like. He just came in and he anointed me. And he said, I'm king of Israel. <laughs> All right. And look at this. Then they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets saying, Jehu is king. Now, what I find interesting about this is it, it's almost like Jehu wasn't taking it serious. Jehu didn't realize the gravity of what just happened. He started saying, oh, he just came in and he anointed me king. But the men that he was with realized the importance of what was going on. And what I find interesting is because Jehu was known as somebody very zealous. But it seems like here when he's anointed king, he's sort of a bit hesitant. But it's his men that were supporting him. It was his men that sort of drove him on. I feel like I can relate to that a bit because I'm a bit, you know, extroverted. I get my energy, my confidence from other people sometimes. When, you know, when I'm with others, I'm a bit more out there and things like that rather than when I'm on my own. So I see that in this passage where he's sort of like, oh man, he's anointed king over Israel. But then when they hear this, they get behind him. And is that what made him such a zealous man? Because once they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with the trumpet saying, Jehu is king, then we start to see him really um, get zealous for the Lord. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. What does that mean? So now he's starting to make plans. How are they going to carry out, taking out the house of Ahab? Now Joram, so Joram it was one of the sons of Ahab, right? So he's currently um, ruling in Israel, right? And the king that's ruling over um, Judah at the time is Ahaziah, and we'll see that soon. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram, Joram being the son of Ahab. So this is why he's conspiring against Joram, because he's wiping out Ahab's house. Now Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead. This is, remember, where Ahab had died. This is where they're fighting Israel and Judah against Syria to keep Ramoth Gilead. He and all Israel because of, look at this, Hazael, king of Syria. So this is how we know that they're fighting. So Hazael is already killing some of Ahab's house. And now Jehu, remember, whoever escapes Hazael's sword, Jehu will slay. But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. And Jehu said, if it, be, if it be your minds that let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel. So what is, what is uh, Jehu saying here? So we get a bit of background to what is happening. He's conspiring against Joram. Joram currently is back, right? Uh, where was he? Um, was returned. He's in Jezreel, right? So Joram is in Jezreel. Why is he there? Because he's wounded from fighting with Hazael, right? And what does he say here at the end? If it be your minds, he's saying, if you guys really believe that I am, am anointed king of Israel and you're getting behind me, then he's saying, don't let anybody in this city escape to go and tell Joram that we're conspiring and we're coming for him. That's what he's saying there. Then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel that they're coming. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. So Ahaziah, why, and, and, and I, this is why I, I'm pretty sure of this, I'm 99% I'm sure, but the reason why I think Ahaziah and Joram are so close 
is because Ahaziah uh, was son-in-law to Ahab because Ahaziah had married Ahab's daughter, one of Jezebel's daughters, right? And this is why there's now like this affinity between them because they're kind of like family now, right? He's like kind of married into the family. This is why they're like starting to work together. So I'm, I'm pretty sure um, that that's from, from what I read before, but I'm pretty sure Ahaziah, that's why they're quite close. So he basically knows that Joram is injured down at Jezreel, and it just so happens that when Jehu is anointed king, right, and he's conspiring against Joram, that it all works out, because God obviously wants to wipe out the, that wicked king as well. You'll see that Ahaziah gets judged here too for working together uh, with Joram, this wicked king, and it just so happens that Joram is injured, and at the same time Jehu's coming to slay the house of Ahab, Ahaziah is coming to see Joram, right, because he's wounded. So now their, you know, their army is coming towards Jezreel, right? Verse 17, and there stood a watchman on the tower. So he's looking out into the distance in Jezreel. And he spied the company of Jehu as he came, right? So the watchman's looking out and he sees Jehu's army coming towards them. Uh, as he said, and he said, I see a company. And Joram said, so Joram, remember, is the king of Israel. Take an horseman and send to meet them. And let him say, is it peace? So what does Joram say to do? He says, hey, to the watchman, hey, send a horseman to go out to see that army that's approaching and ask them, hey, are you approaching? Is it peaceful that you're coming here? Or are you coming to, for war? So they went one on horseback. So this is one messenger, right, on horseback, going out to meet where they're seeing this army that's coming towards them, that's, that's led by Jehu, to meet him and said, thus saith the king, so the messenger speaking on behalf of King Joram, is it peace? And Jehu said, what has thou to do with peace? He's like, what do you know about peace? What do, what do you guys have to do with peace? Right? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, the messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. So what's happening, right? Jehu's riding towards Jezreel. They send out a messenger to say, hey, is it peace? And he goes, what do you know about peace? Get behind me. So the messenger like, joins the army right, and starts going with them. <laughs> Then he sent out a second on horseback. So this is the second messenger that's going now, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them. So the watchman, seeing these, these horsemen go out, right? Because the first one went out. He's not coming back. He says, The second one, He came even unto them and cometh not again. So the second horseman they sent out to ask, Is it peace? He's not returning to tell them whether it's peace or not. And the driving, so this is the driving of the chariot, right? And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. What does that mean? He's coming, right? He's driving that chariot. And they they t can tell that it's Jehu by the way he drives his chariot. And this is why Jehu is known as being a very zealous man, right? He does things very passionate. He does things way over the top, as we'll see next week in chapter 10. Um, verse 21, and Joram said, make ready so because the messengers are not coming back to find out now the king gets ready so Joram, remember he's a bit injured right he's laying at jezreel trying to recover but because the messengers are not coming back the third time now he gets ready make ready and his chariot was made ready and joram king of israel look at this and ahaziah king of judah went out so they both get ready they get into their chariots now they're going out to meet jehu who is coming to slay the house of Ahab. they don't know that yet right and Joram king of Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah went out, each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu, and look at this, and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Because remember, this was where it all started, right? Because he slew Naboth the Jezreelite and took his vineyard, and that's why Ahab's house was going to get wiped out. It didn't happen in his day, remember, because Ahab humbled himself. This is why it's happening in his son's day. What's interesting about this story is when the kings finally go, okay, we're going to get ready and go and meet Jehu, the point where they meet is right at Naboth's vineyard, <laughs> right? So it's kind of like reminding us, say, hey, Naboth's vineyard is why this all started and this is where it's going to, this judgment's going to start, right? Verse 22. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? Right? So they've met at Naboth's vineyard, right? Now they're seeing each other eye to eye. Joram says to Jehu, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? 
So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many, so they're shouting at each other, Joram turned his hands. What does that mean? He tried to turn his chariot around and fled and said to Ahaziah, right, the king of Judah, there is treachery, O Ahaziah. So he's turned his chariot around. And now the Bible says, and Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jer Jer uh, Jehoram between his arms. So Joram and Jehoram are just two ways to say the same name in the Bible. You'll see that. And smote Jehoram between his arms. So this is in the back, right? Because remember, he's turned his chariot. Now Jehu draws a bow, fires it. It goes between his arms in the back. Look at this. And the arrow went out at his heart and he sunk down in his chariot. Now, this, is, this is pretty epic. You know, I don't know why these people that make Bible movies, why do they have to change things? You know, if you just like made a movie and just made it what the Bible said, I mean, it'd be epic enough. You know, this is pretty crazy where he meets him. He goes, hey, it's treachery. Or it's like, he turns his chariot and it's like, whoa. You know, this, is, this is the stuff movies are made of, right? Drew a bow with his full strength. Arrow went between his arms. The arrow went out at his heart and he sunk down in his chariot. So this is where it begins, at the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. Then said Jehu to Bidkar his captain, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth. So this is interesting that Jehu, he knew about this, right? Because he rode, he served Ahab, right? So he knew that there was going to be judgment on Ahab's house because of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, saith the Lord. And I will requite thee in this plat, in this, this part of land, right, saith the Lord. Now therefore, take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. So he kills Joram, right, in the chariot. And he says, cast him into the, into the vineyard of Naboth, like the Lord had spoken. But when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, do you remember they're both there? He fled by the way of the garden house. So now he's trying to get away from Jehu. And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up to Ger, which is by Iblium. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. Right? So he got struck as well. He's trying to flee away. But in Megiddo, Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So now both kings of Israel and Judah have both died. And his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his sepulchre with his fathers in the city of David. And in the 11th year of Joram, the son of Ahab began Ahaziah to reign over Judah. <clears throat> and when, so that's just going back, so it's just a, like a statement again, just saying, hey, this is when Ahaziah began to reign, but it talks about his death here in 2 Kings 9. All right, so you remember they met in the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Now he's continuing to Jezreel, right? And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. Now, it's interesting that the only woman in the Bible that is described as painting her face is Jezebel, right? So, ladies, you don't want to be thought of as painting your face too much. Like, some women just put on way too much makeup. You know what I mean? So just think about this, ladies. The Bible gives us, it's like when the Bible says the attire of an harlot, right? It gives us some clues into, hey, how we should dress how we should present ourselves and things like that and some women these days put on way too much makeup in my opinion right and it's interesting that in the bible this is one of the things that jezebel is known for she gets up she painted her face and tired her head so i don't know if tired her head means like she's kind of leaning out the window right you're resting your head and looked out at a window and as jehu entered in at the gate she said had zimri peace who slew his master. Now, this is an interesting reference, right? So what does she say? She sees Jehu come in, right? And she knows something is up. She knows that Jehu is here on the offense. So when Jehu comes in, what she says to Jehu is, hey, there's another man, Zimri, who slew his master, and did he have peace? Now, let's just look at that story quickly, because this is where uh, we see the difference between Zimri, who also slew his master, and Jehu, right, who's, slewing, uh, is, who's killing Ahab's house, Joram, which is his master, right, because he's captain of the host. And it's interesting that Zimri was also a captain of the host that slew his master. 
So 1 Kings 16, then the word of the Lord came to Jehu. So this is the other Jehu. So don't get mixed up with Jehu, the son of Nimshi, with Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha. Remember that name? The Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and Baasha, right? This is the other wicked king that was walking in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So we're going back, you remember, to 1 Kings 16. So this is like even before Ahab. Saying, For as much as I exalted thee out of the dust and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the way of Jeroboam and hast made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. Behold, I will take away the posterity of Baasha and the posterity of his house and will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So similar to Ahab, judgment came on Baasha's house because he had caused Israel to sin that God said, hey, your, your line is going to be wiped out as well, right? Him that dieth of Baasha in the city shall the dogs eat and him that dieth of his in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha and what he did in his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Baasha slept with his fathers and was buried in Terzah, and Elah, his son, reigned in his stead. So in Baasha's absence, now that he's dead, right, Elah, his son, reigns in his stead. But I wanted to show you just the, those statements about Baasha, because this is why Zimri kills his master. Right? He is actually carrying out the judgment that God had put on Baasha. And also, uh, by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, came the word of the Lord against Baasha and against his house, even for all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, in provoking him to anger with the work of his hands, in being like the house of Jeroboam, and because he killed him. In the twenty and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel in Terzah two years. And his servant, Zimri, so you remember Zimri, which, which is the man that Jezebel is referring to, says, and his servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Terza. So remember, Baasha died, but God said, hey, we're gonna wipe, I'm going to wipe out your house. Elah takes the kingdom after Baasha, Zimri is, one, is the captain, right? One of the captains of half his chariots, right? So like Jehu was one of the captains of the host, so was Zimri, right? Conspired against him, right? Like remember he conspired against Joram? As he was in Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Terza. So what did Zimri do? He basically killed Elah the king while he was at a drunken party, right? And Zimri went in and smote him and killed him in the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his stead. And it came to pass when he began to reign. So now Zimri is reigning, right? When he began to reign, as soon as he sat on his throne, that he slew all the house of Baasha. He left him not one that pisseth against the wall. So you see there's that phrase again, saying that all the men, all the sons of Baasha are wiped out so that he has no more line to carry on his name. He left him not one that pisseth against the wall, neither of his kinsfolks nor of his friends. Thus did Zimri, Zimri destroy all the house of Baasha according to the word of the Lord, which he spake against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, by which they sinned, and by which they made Israel to sin, in provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? I just want to show you the rest of the story, it's really interesting. It says here in 1 Kings 16, In the twenty and seventh year of Asa king of Judah, did Zimri reign seven days? So this is what Jezebel is referring to, right? Because Zimri conspires against the king Elah, right? And then he rules and kills off Baasha's house. So he, he, he actually does what God had judged on, on, on Baasha's house, but he only reigns for seven days, right? Asa king of Judah, did Zimri reign seven days? So this is why Jezebel is saying, yeah, Zimri slew his master, but did he have peace? Meaning, is he going to reign for many years? Because Zimri only reigned for seven days. Because what happened to Zimri? In Terza, and the people were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. So while Zimri is doing this, right, while he conspires against Elah, 
the host, the army, is actually out fighting against the Philistines, right? They're encamped against Gibbethon, which belongeth to the Philistines. And the people that were encamped heard say, Zimri hath conspired and hath also slain the king. Wherefore, all Israel made Omri, the captain of the host, king over Israel that day in the camp. So what's happening here? Zimri is reigning in his seven days, right? Seven days, the, the, the Israelite army, right, is fighting against the Philistines. They hear about what Zimri, did, Zimri does. And then Omri, which is one of the captain of the host, they, they make him king. Right? And now they're going back to fight against Zimri. I don't know if it's Zimri or Zimri. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, one of the two. And Omri went up from Gibbethon and all Israel with him, and they besieged Terza. And it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire, and he died. So why did Zimri only reign seven days? He killed off Baasha's house. They heard about it. They made Omri king. They came back and when he, came, when he was trying to defend against them, right? But then when he realized that they had taken the city and he couldn't hold them, he just lit his house on fire and just basically committed suicide. And that was the end, right? Of, of uh, Zimri's reign, which, was only, which only lasted a week. Uh, for his sins which he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the way of Jeroboam, in his sin which he did to make Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his treason that he wrought are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Now, I guess you've got to ask your question. You've got to ask the question, right? What's the, what's, the, why, why, what's the difference between what Zimri did and what Jehu did? Why, why when Jehu conspired against his master and wiped out Ahab's house, he, he, was, he was blessed for doing that, whereas Zimri wasn't, even though he carried out a judgment of the Lord? Well, it's because Zimri wasn't told to do it. Right? Zimri, Zimri, of his own lust, conspired against his master to become king. And this is what Jezebel is thinking Jehu is doing, right? That's why she's saying, has Zimri peace that flew his master? But maybe what she doesn't know is that this is, this is actually judgment. I mean, she should know, right? Because Ahab was told, you know, unless Ahab didn't tell his wife, right? But Ahab was told because he slew Naboth that his, his house was going to get wiped out. Maybe they didn't know that Jehu was going to do it. Right? because that was told to Elijah in the mountain. So she's thinking that's what Jehu is doing, and that's why he's saying, do, do, do you have peace? But see, Jehu was carrying out the will of the Lord because Jehu actually did it at the Lord's command, not just of his own lust. That's why, you know, that's the difference. And that's why Zimri didn't have peace, but Jehu did reign for many years after uh, he carried out this task. So the application there is, you know, and I'll finish on a different application just with the last couple of verses, but the application there is, it's interesting that the same act, you know, because they did the same thing, right? They conspired against their master, and they, you know, Zimri slew all the house of Baasha, Jehu slew all the house of Ahab, but the, what made it right and wrong was whether it was in line with God's commandments, right? And it's the same in our Christian life, right? You think about, you know, people may do the same thing in their Christian life, go to church, try and live right, you know, read your Bible and pray, but if people are doing that to get to heaven, then they're going to go to hell, right? But if they're doing that because they're saved, right, because they love God, he says it can be the same act, but different. It's the same with fornication and marriage. People say like, yeah, well, what's the point of getting married, right? We already live together, we already own a house together. We're already sleeping together. We already have children together. Well, the difference is one follows God's commandments and one doesn't. So it's the same with Zimri here. One didn't follow God's commandments. One did follow God's commandments, even though they were doing the same acts, right? So we have to make sure in our life we do things according to God's commandments, not just think, well, I'm doing the same thing. What's the point of keeping God's commandments? So that's the application there. Now let's just finish. There's just a couple of verses left in 2 Kings 9 where we see Jezebel actually die here, right? Verse 32. And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? So this is Jehu, right? Calling up to where uh, Jezebel is. And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. So two or three eunuchs are people that, you know, have lost their manhood, right? So that they don't, uh, they're not tempted to sleep with the queen. They serve the queen. So they look out of the window, right? And he said, throw her down, right? So the eunuchs are on my side. He said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood 
was sprinkled on the wall. So this is quite vivid, this, this, uh, this, this imagery here, right? Where she's thrown down and basically, you know, blood splashes onto the wall and on the horses and he trod her underfoot. And you probably will never see that in a kid's, you know, kid's book anywhere, right? But this is what happens. This is how God thinks of Ahab's house and Jezebel, that she was thrown out of the window, right? And not only that, that Jehu trod her, right? his horses trampled on her, right? Underfoot. And when he was come in, right? So after he tramples Jezebel into the ground, he did eat and drink. So he goes in, he has a meal, right? <laughs> and said, go see now this cursed woman and bury her. For she is a king's daughter. So he's like, okay, maybe we should bury her because she is, she is the daughter of a king. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than, her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hand. So this is how this prophecy was carried out, that the dogs would eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel because she was thrown out of the wall. Jehu trods her underfoot and then the dogs came and then they couldn't even recognize. Remember it says, nobody can say this is Jezebel, right? Because all that's left of her is the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall, they shall not say, This is Jezebel. You know, and that's where the story ends. You know, in terms of, to, that's where Jezebel's story ends. Jehu's story continues, and we're going to go on that next week. But what's the application here when we think about Je Jezebel? Obviously, this is probably not something you've ever heard preached in church before, unless you go to a church like this, where people actually, you know, will go to these stories and explain to you what's going on. But sometimes people see these stories of wicked people like Ahab, you know, these kings, Jezebel especially, a wicked person. And they think, oh, that's a little harsh, isn't it? You know, they think that's a little harsh that she's thrown out of a window and trod underfoot and things like that. And, and people will say things like, well, that's not very loving of God. You know, like when, when you talk against the evil people of this world, they say, oh, you should be more loving. You know, it doesn't matter how many babies get aborted, how many people get killed at war. They just think, oh, you know, it's not very loving that people are treated this way. We think of them this way. But no, like we shouldn't have pity for the wicked. This is the point of this story. Like it's like there's no pity for the wicked because you need to understand what Jezebel did. She killed so many prophets of the Lord. So many people died because of Jezebel. And if you read this story and you think that's kind of harsh, I don't think it's harsh enough, right? Because after this, she's going to go to hell. There's hell after this. And we ought not to pity the wicked when we hear about wicked things. We ought to have a righteous anger like God does. And it's something it's hard for us to comprehend in the flesh. It's hard for us to comprehend people going to hell. Right? But it tells us the holiness of God. And I firmly believe this, that when we, when we shed our flesh, like we think about people going to hell now, we think, oh, it's terrible. And, and you know, people say, oh, how can a loving God create hell? But one thing I believe is when we shed this flesh and we see people get thrown down, we're not going to question God's judgment. You know, I believe we're going to stand there and be, amen. Because we're going to see wickedness and sin as God sees it. And it's the same here. People will read this story about Jezebel and they'll think, oh, you know, that's not very loving. You know, where's the mercy and the grace? Well, when it comes to wickedness like this, you know, this is almost not enough, you know? Because she's going to go to hell after this. So we don't want to pity the wicked. We're not going to be sad. I, mean, I don't believe we're going to be sad when we shed this flesh about people going to hell. I know that doesn't sound good, but that's what I believe. Because, you know, if you think about what hell is, right? Hell is God's righteous judgment. And nobody's in, nobody in the spirit is going to be standing there on that day when people are cast into the lake of fire thinking that God is being too harsh or God is doing the wrong thing. Right? We're going to see wickedness as God sees it and realize this is why people go to hell. But you know, he does have grace. Right, People are given time now to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So they have time now to, to receive that grace. But if they don't, all that's left for them is the wrath of God. And especially wicked people in this world that are responsible for so many innocent lives, killing babies, killing people, killing righteous and innocent people, we ought not to have pity on them.
So I hope you learned something from this story. So just remember a few of the applications. One of them is it's futile running from the judgment of God, right? So it's just better that we fear God and we keep his commandments and do as he ought. You know, as children, thank God we have his grace, right? But, you know, we don't want to push that grace too far, right? Because God can chastise us as children. Um, remember as well, you may be doing the same things, but if it's not according to the word of the Lord, you know, especially with marriage and fornication, just things that people do in the world. Hey, just because it's the same thing doesn't mean it's right, you know, especially when it comes to fornication. And the last thing is, you know, when you read stories like this, when you read about the judgment of God, and this is why it's so important to know what's going on in the Bible, because people always paint God like, oh, this Old Testament God, he's so mean, right? He's always just judging people. He's just, just ruining people's parties and ruin, being, you know, poo-pooing on their parade. But then when you actually read through the Bible, you realize what these kings were doing, what these nations were doing. And if you get the right perspective, and we start seeing it from God's point of view, you realize why God is so angry with what they're doing. Anyway, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, uh, thank you for the reminder that you're a righteous God. Help us, Lord, not to question uh, your righteousness. Help us to understand, Lord, you know, um, question in the sense we want to understand why you see these things this way. But Lord, help us not to, you know, do foolishly and accuse you of being unjust and being, uh, you know, as the world would paint a picture of you. Uh, Lord, you were so good to these people. You were so good to these nations. You blessed them. You, 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 you poured your blessings on them. And, um, but Lord, they just, you know, they wanted to work wicked, wickedness. They turned from you. And uh, Lord, uh, help us to never, you know, doubt your holiness and your righteous judgments. Help us to understand, you know, and, and have a righteous anger about sin so thank you lord for this story and i pray that it was a blessing to the church here and they learned a lot i pray lord it would encourage us and motivate us to read our bibles and get into the the many interesting stories that are in there and thank you lord for the lord jesus because of his blood we are spared from the judgment we so rightly deserve so thank you lord for that thank you for saving us uh, we pray these things in his name amen